Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure it is and an honor to be here with you this morning on Sunday, August 19th in the calendar year of the Gregorian calendar, 2018. Um, I don't know about you, but personally for me, it's great to hear that there ain't no mountain high enough or there ain't no valley low enough to keep me from getting to you. And so I'm really pleased that we're here together. It's been a wild week for me. I know it's been the same for many of you. And um, it's really fantastic that we have the opportunity to come together on Sunday mornings in our beloved home here that we share with the amazing congregation, Cole and me. Um, and yeah, we can clap for that. And ground ourselves and center ourselves in knowing who we are as divine beings. So we are the Center for Spiritual Living Los Angeles, and we come together every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We're a metaphysical, new thought spiritual community that welcomes and celebrates all facets of life, and we do that for each and every one of you, whether you're here with us live and in person, or you're watching us live stream, or through Facebook Live. The vision statement for our community is supporting individuals finding their personal self-empowerment through a spiritual awakening. What that means to us is that each and every one of us as sentient beings on our journey of life have the opportunity to awaken to the divinity that exists within us. And once we are awakened to that, we then have the opportunity to let that power, that energy be empowering to us so that our personal lives get better and better and better. And in so doing, we impact all of humanity in a way that life gets better for all of humanity. Primarily here, we practice the philosophy known as the science of mind. In its original incarnation, it was considered a new thought teaching. In its modern incarnation in this 21st century, it's known as a philosophy, a faith, a way of life. We welcome all genders, all races, all religions, all countries of origins, all sexual orientations, all ethnicities, all abilities, all aspects of life. We welcome and celebrate you, and we stand with you in life. But as our beloved founding minister used to say every Sunday morning when this church center began over 30 years ago, we welcome one and we welcome all. And so if you're here for the first time, thank you for being here with us. We have a beautiful morning planned for you today, and I'm really excited. We have a guest speaker, Rabbi Denise Egger, who is the founding rabbi here in Congregation Kolomi, is here to um, share her wisdom with us today, and you'll hear more about that in a little bit later. Our musicians for the day are Enjoy Fountain, who's now in the back of the room, but... <clears throat> Enjoy has already accomplished something that rarely happens, certainly here on a Sunday morning, is that you all were on your feet and your groove thing was moving at the same time. So thank you, enjoy to that. Our co-music director, Andy Belling, here behind the keyboard. And we're happy to have back with us this morning, we haven't seen you in a couple of weeks, our percussionist, Guy Azule. So, we open our service every Sunday morning with a ritual. And the purpose of that ritual is for us to take this bundle of energy that's taking place in this room, the energy that was taking place in this room Friday night, Rabbi Denise was saying there was some Aretha Franklin being sung in here Friday night. Um, feel the love that always takes place in this room and um, take all of that in and bring it into the center of your being to honor the oneness of life that exists within you. The particular ritual that we're doing this morning honors the qualities of the divine. And so I invite you to not only hear Hear those for yourself in a new way today, but to also honor anyone that has made their transition or their passing this past week or even in any time in your life, or anyone that you may know in your life that's struggling that they don't know that they are those qualities of the divine. So I invite you to open up to that. Um, you will hear this ritual is, has several pieces to it. One is a Reverend Edward reading the ritual and there being a lighting of the candles by, um, I believe, Connie, you're lighting them today, right? No, who's lighting the candles today? I just had a, it was supposed to be Nancy, but she's not here. So Wendy will do that. So Wendy's gonna light our candles today. Sorry about that, Connie. Um, and then our musicians will take us through, <laughs> Connie, Connie, kind of get out the paddles. Um, and so the, um, our musicians will take you through a, a call and response piece to sing along, and then that will be closed with what's called spiritual mind treatment or affirmative prayer, so do that. 
As Reverend Edward comes forward and Wendy to take us through that, I'd like for us to take a moment and acknowledge that, and the 10th candle is called the healing candle, and it's to honor anyone that you'd like to put in the light of the healing flame. And as you possibly have read on our Facebook page, one of our more recent congregants, Craig Mason, made his transition. And um, it was quite unexpected and unfortunate, as most transitions are. And so whether you know him or not by face, um, please just remember that he is moved on to the next dimension. And let's hold him in that light, that healing light, as well as his family. He leaves behind a 14 and a 16-year-old daughter, 14 and 16-year-old daughters. And so um, I'll, that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's just hold him in the light. Thank you. Reverend Edward. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's amazing that I'm here with this cane. Yeah. <laughs> calling in the light. Calling in the light. Calling in the light of love. Calling in the light, calling in the light, calling in the light of love. The ritual we perform today is called Calling in the Light. Today, we promote this ceremony to promote the universal consciousness of life which acknowledges that all people, all faith, all beings come from the one all-abiding presence, which is spirit. The purpose of this ritual is to draw into our consciousness, our gathering this morning, a conscious awareness of our oneness and the qualities we possess as complete expressions of the divine. The first quality, as Wendy lights the candle, is called peace. In this way, we honor our inherent divine state of inner calm, regardless of any seeming chaos that is unfolding around us or within us. The second quality is the quality of power. The power we acknowledge is as the energy by which everything exists. Wendy lights the third candle for the quality of beauty, a personal expression of which high spiritual qualities are made manifest. We all have that beauty within us, and we express that beauty. The fourth candle Wendy lights is called the joy. That state of being that is executed by expectancy and experiences of good, joy. That expectancy of good, knowing that we are the joy of God. The fifth candle that Wendy, Wendy, the Wendy lights today <laughs> is the candle for light, the symbol of divine intelligence. The sixth candle is lit for all life, that which is defined as the emanating principle of being, life, that which is defined as the animating principle of being, that inner something that makes everything live. The seventh candle is lit for love, the quality of love that defined as the self-givingness of spirit, the desire of life to express itself by giving of itself. We express love by giving of ourselves, for we are love in action. As Wendy lights the eighth candle, which is for wisdom, the quality of unity in the mystical secret is the mystical secret of the ages and the key to wisdom. Wisdom is an all-knowing 
and we all are knowing beings. The ninth candle, which is the final candle that Wendy lights, is called the healing candle. In this moment, we take someone or ourselves and we bring to that light and we speak a word of healing for that individual, knowing that a healing is always, at all times, taking place. I am love, I am peace, I am peace in my heart, in my heart, I am free, I am spirit, I am soul, all together. We are whole, calling in the light, calling in the light, calling in the light of love, calling in the light. Calling in the light, calling in the light of love. And so it is, and so, and so it, is. it is, and so it is. I would like for you to join with me in a spiritual mind treatment knowing that we are speaking the words of truth, of life, of love, of joy. There is only one life, one power, one presence. That is God. God is all in all, expressing at all levels of awareness. For we are one with God because we are each an individualization of the one, expressing as God at our, at our level of awareness. We give thanks today, knowing that we have recognized the qualities of God that reside within each and every one of us. Life, love, beauty, peace, joy, wisdom, light. We know that a healing is taking place this moment. And for that individual that we have brought into the light, we can speak our word knowing that he or she or ourselves is making that demonstration this moment, now, in this moment. The only thing we have to change is our consciousness about truth, knowing that God is all in all, and this is the day that God has made, and we rejoice in it and are happy for the idea of knowing that all is well, life is good, and we are truly blessed. We joyously give thanks for this opportunity of expressing and experiencing these qualities. We give thanks for this idea that we call Center for Spiritual Living Los Angeles. Knowing that this idea is a beacon light into this city, into the world, we give thanks for our minister, knowing that he is here by right of his own consciousness. We give thanks for our guest speaker today, knowing that she is here to share with us principles of love, joy, and peace. We give thanks for the musicians, knowing that they are lending their talent to make this whole thing a wonderful experience. 
We give thanks for the practitioners, the staff ministers, the volunteers, for every individual that is making this whole thing a manifestation today. We joyously give thanks and we release this treatment knowing that it is done this moment, right here and now. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you, Reverend Edward, so wonderful. <sighs> Room feels different now, doesn't it? But in a good, it's building on the energy we had before. So our first uh, song that's being, guest song that's being sung by Enjoy this morning, um, has, as typically they are for us, has been curated for the message that's gonna be presented today. And this particular song, um, is one that is one of my all-time favorites. Actually, both are two of my all-time favorites. But this one in particular, because it speaks to what many of us have experienced this week with the passing of many people. And um, so I know it was um, brought to us by the divine, the divine being fully expressed as Enjoy Fountain and the men behind her. And so um, I present to you Enjoy and the song Home. a place where there's love overflowing. I wish I was home. I wish I was back there with the things I've been knowing. When that makes the tall grass bend into leaning, suddenly the raindrops that fall have a meaning.
Enjoy Fountain. Perfect name for perfect being, right? So the amazing woman that you're about to be um, experiencing, to get to experience this amazing individual, is someone that personally I'm so happy has come into my life. Um, when I took over this, our community as your spiritual leader and we moved over here, um, one of the components for me that was important was to be in a home for our community, which we now have. But to also be able to share that with someone who um, has walked the pathway of ministry and for some period of time, and to bounce ideas off and to get feedback from, and um, to just really have an ear, but also not just an ear, a heart. And uh, Rabbi Denise Egger is that. She's an ear and a brain and a mind and a heart, of course, in the human sense and in the divine sense. But as a rabbi, she has been a groundbreaking individual in her life. She was raised in Memphis, Tennessee. She served pulpits, pulpits in Canada, New York, and Los Angeles. Following ordination, she served Congregation Beth Chaim Hadashim for four years. Did I get that right? That's close, right? For four years as a full-time rabbi, and she went on to, to be the founding rabbi for Congregation Kolomi here, West Hollywood's Reform Synagogue. Um, one of her beliefs that she will speak on is that activism is an important part of her rabbinate. She's the past president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, which is the largest organization of rabbis in the world, with more than 2,000 reformed rabbis. And in 2015, she became the 60th president of the CCAR, that organization, being the first openly gay or lesbian rabbi to that, pos to that position. She was instrumental in passing the March 2000 CCAR resolution in support of officiation of gay and lesbian commitment ceremonies. She's the co-author of the official reform movement gay and lesbian wedding liturgy. She's written many articles that has been published throughout. She's won numerous awards for her dedication and her activism. In 2011, she was named the LGBT icon for her long history of activism and service for the Gay and Lesbian History Month for the Equality Forum. And in 2008, she had the honor of officiating the first legal wedding for a lesbian couple in California. She, yes, right? She was also just featured in a documentary called A Long Walk to Freedom, which um, chronicled the history of the advocate, um, prominently featured in that from what I understand. She's a noted speaker on the topics of human sexuality, LGBT issues and Judaism, AIDS, the changing Jewish family, spirituality and health issues in Judaism and politics, progressive Judaism and the radical right, and more. You are blessed and you have a great opportunity to hear the wisdom and the insight and the love and the compassion of my soul sister, who I'm so happy to have her here in her home, Rabbi Denise Egger. Good morning, everybody. I'm so delighted. I'm I'm delighted to um, be here with you this morning and to share in this uh, moment of healing and spirituality together. And I just have to say, I've, I've, I've brought greetings before to, for you, to you all, but I'm so honored that uh, Keith asked me to come speak this morning and to, to share some words with you. He, he, I, I, this got started, I asked, he did it in July for Kolomi. He came to Kolomi. So this is my return uh, of the invitation back. And um, it, it's just such a delight to have you all here. You have brought such a, a energy uh, to our community by your presence here. So, so I want to just thank you for that. Thank you for bringing your teachings and your light uh, to our communal light. And um, we've done some great projects together over the course of your time being here to help the homeless and to help refugees and the fleeing the terrible circumstances in Syria. And, and Keith and I have talked about uh, what are other ways we can cooperate together to, to build community between our, our two communities. So um, thank you for your presence here and for being here and for inviting me to come and join with you today, uh, this morning. Um, I, I, I'm a, um, in our tradition, we are kind of old-fashioned sermonizers, so I hope you'll forgive my uh, bringing my tradition here um, to all of you. Um, the queen is dead. 
Usually when we hear those words, we say, long live the king or long live the queen, meaning that we praise the rightful heir to the throne. In fact, I was watching the movie the other night for the umpteenth time, uh, Victoria and Abdul. Maybe you saw it about Queen Victoria and her friend from India. And there's a moment when the queen dies towards the end of the movie and uh, the palace crier places a notice on Buckingham Palace gates, and this is exactly what he says. The queen is dead. Long live the king. But let's face it. With the death of Aretha Franklin, the queen of soul, I don't know who can take her mantle. She was, as we know, one of a kind. Truly a musical prodigy. Elton John introduced her at her last performance this past November at a benefit for his AIDS Foundation with these words. You are the greatest singer of all time, he said. He was concurring with a panel of 179 musical experts that in 2010 voted Aretha Franklin the greatest singer of all time and it was published in Rolling Stone magazine, no less. Her childhood friend Smokey Robinson they knew each other as children, remembered her singing at the age of four and already starting to play complicated chords on the piano. But did you know she never learned to read a lick of music? She was so talented, so brilliant, that music just oozed out of her. Now, I, I know I'm not saying anything, perhaps, that you haven't read in the countless articles that have been posted and in newspapers and have been on television. You've read a lot. But her death on Thursday, which I add, is the same day that Elvis died. And I want to tell you, he, yes, he really did die. But it's brought out all of this streams of articles and press on her incredible life journey and her music. She did it all. The first woman inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So many Grammys, unbelievable. She had 18 Grammys and sold over 75 million records. And between 1968 and 1975 alone, she won a Grammy at least one every year, 10 during just those years. That, my friends, is incredible. And she was nominated for so many more, over 40. Think about that. And she, in her way, was one of the first crossover artists. She wasn't just pigeonholed into one area. You know, yes, the queen of soul. Yes, that's how we think about it. But the truth is, she sang gospel. She sang R&B. She sang rock and roll. She sang jazz. She sang American standards. And she even sang opera. Her, she changed the world the night she subbed for Luciano Pavarotti on that Grammy broadcast, singing from Puccini's Turandot. And she had the honor of singing for the Pope that same aria. This was someone who embodied dignity, who did it literally her way. Like me and Elvis, Aretha was from Memphis, although she really was from Detroit. She grew up in her father's New Bethel Baptist Church. And the Reverend C.L. Franklin was well-known, an iconic preacher and known for his own silvery voice and rousing sermons. And, and he preached on the radio. He often subbed for Dr. King. And Aretha grew up singing Sunday in church from the time she was just a child. But her life was no easy street, and we have lots to learn from that life. Her first child was born at 12 years old. And it was only when she was 15 she had her second child. And she bravely and courageously left her children in her family's care at 18 to go to New York to pursue this incredible talent that she had and a singer and to support her family. See, I know some people say, oh, she left her children. 
No, she didn't leave her children. She went to work to support her family. She was married several times. She experienced physical abuse and verbal abuse in those relationships. Not to mention manipulations by music company and recording industry executives who thought, usually white men, that they knew better. But she held her ground and she spoke up and she did it her way. And she didn't let them manipulate her. A friend of mine told me the other night with some folks that used to work with her, because of those manipulations, every night of her tours and concert, a bag of about $25,000 was always delivered to her and guarded right by her side. And every night after the show, she'd pay out in cash to her musicians for their work. A day's work, a day's pay. Why? She didn't want anybody to know or to think that somehow she was beholden to them. She wanted them to know that she was the boss. And I say good for her. She endured other tragedies. Her beloved father was shot in the head during a home robbery and lay in coma for five years. And during that time, she lived right here in Encino and she would schlep almost every weekend to go be by her father's bedside. And he never recovered. And then both of her siblings died of cancer. But yet, her resilience, her faith, grounded her. And she marched forward with those smoky tones and brilliant melismas and interpretations her earthly and heavenly soul lifted us all. I've been struck by the way so many of us have been so deeply affected by her life and, yes, by her death this past week. She was truly a diva in the best sense of that word, a musical diva, but really a musical genius. And she represents so much more, I think, an empowered African-American woman at a time when it was difficult, truly difficult for both being a woman and African-American in our country. And she was and is and I think will remain a role model, not just for African-Americans, not just for women, but I think as she teaches us a lesson by her life. She paved the way, especially during those turbulent years of the civil rights movement and women's liberation, and she spoke her mind about it often. And she lived her life profoundly and proudly without apology. And she lifted us up through the boldness of her forthright manner and through her great, great talent. That's the word I think of, empowerment, when I think of her. What a mighty example of using your gifts for humanity. And she used the gifts not of her voice not only to sing, but to speak out for justice. She used her talent to enrich the lives of others. And she was generous with her spirit. She often used her talents for charity, waiving her fees to raise money, not only for Elton John Zaid's foundation at the end of her life, but she was a grand supporter of the NAACP on many, many children's charities. She was an example, sharing so deeply from her soul. And she taught us, I think through her music, that you can touch the soul of another human being. You see, that queen of soul isn't just about a genre of music. I think that queen of soul is about what filled her inside. And that's what she really shared with us through her music. You see, sharing your soul, isn't that the point of being in relationship anyways? That we can touch the soul of another human being. To gently hold it. To caress it. To lift up one another. Her music did that for us. And perhaps, 
I think it's that soul piece, not the musical soul, but that inner soul that touched and moved us so deeply and that we have been transformed as her soul leaves her body and returns to the spirit of the universe. Truly the queen of soul was the queen of teaching us to connect our souls to one another. But what of this soul-to-soul -soul connection? In Jewish tradition, we believe strongly in the life of the soul. We human beings, according to Jewish thought, are ensouled by God, the source and fountain of the universe. See, we even use that language here from the book of Psalms. With you is the fountain of life, by your light, meaning God's light, do we see light. The very breath within us, according to Jewish tradition, is our soul. We breathe it in and out and in and out. That's our soul moving within us. It's the part of the God that we, that we Jews call, that's part of God that lives inside of us. And we share a bit of our soul just through the act of breathing. We share it with the world. And it's so interconnected that we know this from our fifth grade science classes, right? We breathe out carbon dioxide. The plants breathe in the carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen. You see, that is spiritual, not just scientific. It's a soul-to-soul -soul connection. In our Jewish tradition, when we read the myths and stories and history in our Torah scroll, in the Bible, we look first to the creation story in the book of Genesis. And it says there, and God made human, the human being from the dust of the earth and breathed the first breath into the human. Now, I didn't say man, right? I said the human. Because Adam, Adam in common parlance, but Adam from the Hebrew word for earth, Adama, is the first human being. And in that first creation story, wait, wait, you made me back up. Did you know there were two creation stories in the Bible? In Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 don't agree. There are two different stories. You see, the first story, the first human being, is both male and female. It's almost an androgynous human being. But they carry within them that first human in the Garden of Eden, the essence that is all holy and pure in their very being. We call that the soul. This first human creature is not Adam and Eve, but simply Adam human being, who is the essence of God. The soul is what animates that first being, and then Jewish tradition believes animates every subsequent human being. So when we say we have a soul connection with someone, we're saying something so powerful and so deep. It isn't just lust or chemistry. When your soul recognizes another soul, you're recognizing, according to Jewish tradition at least, the part of God who dwells within. The divine spirit. The first breath that filled the first Adam. Now, the Bible has three words in Hebrew to distinguish between soul, breath. First is neshama. neshama. It's actually that first animation of life and is the word used in the book of Genesis. The soul breath of God that is within us, the neshama. And then there is ruach in Hebrew, which ruach is an interesting word because it can also mean wind that blows. But this breath soul connection ends with death. And finally, there is the word nefesh, which can mean soul, or it can mean in Hebrew and later versions of Hebrew. A nephesh can actually just be a person. But even an animal 
according to Jewish thought, has a nefesh behema, an animal soul. It's different than a human soul, but, but my tradition recognizes that all life has this divine spirit moving within them. The ancients recognized that the animals were that special form of life, different from human beings, but nevertheless with a special kind of soul. I know you see it when you look in your dog's eyes or when you gently pet your cat. You hear it in the birds and their music that they make. That's just not, we're just not a collection of molecules and synapses and electrical charges running through. But I think you all share a philosophy that we share, that the divine force is flowing through us, that that light is within us, and that our calling is to share that light to transform the world. A bit later in the evolution of Jewish thought on the soul, we see that the neshama and ruach, those two versions of soul, denote eternality. You see, the soul really doesn't stop when the body wears out. In the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible, in the later part of our Bible, we see that Ruach makes this jump in this verse. The dust returns to the ground where it has been, and Ruach, the spirit, the soul, returns to God who gave it. We read these very passages at a funeral. It informs our Jewish worldview that our body and our soul are supposed to be in harmony until they separate at the moment of death. And then at that moment, our eternal soul, our ruach, our neshama, returns to God and becomes one with the spirit of the universe that we call God. Now, the Talmud, which is a later collection of Jewish legal wisdom and stories and parables, teaches us these words. Just as the Holy One of Blessing fills the world, so do does the neshama, the soul, fill the body. And just as the Holy One of Blessing sees but cannot be seen, so does the soul see but cannot be seen. And just as the Holy One of Blessing is pure, so the soul is pure. You see, we might think about things that are, take us off the path of righteousness and justice. We might even act on the things that take us off the path of righteousness and justice. But the truth is, the soul isn't bad. And that we can renew our spirit. We can renew our soul. We can repurify ourselves. Unlike some traditions, Judaism does not believe that you are damned to hell forever. We don't, we, we don't do that. Why? Because we believe the soul is pure, holy and pure and a gift from the divine energy of the universe breathed into us filling us, animating us. And our challenge in the day-to-day -day life is to live our lives in such a way that shares that soul connection and recognizes that we are all created, as we say in Hebrew, B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. That's why the Jewish community for so long has always identified with the underdog because, frankly, we've been the underdog. We, we know what anti-Semitism is, real and experienced. We've seen it throughout the generations. Did you know the Jews were never citizens of the country until Napoleon Bonaparte? We, we weren't citizens of any country. We, we didn't belong in any country. We were always the other. And it wasn't until Napoleon Bonaparte that Jews were invited anywhere to become citizens. And... Then even in Germany, not till 1821, and even in our own country, 
at the founding of the United States of America, guess what? In most of the colonies, Jews were not considered citizens because they were not allowed to own land. People don't understand this, especially in these days and times, because, oh, Jews, they're just white folk. But that's just not true about us either. So there's lots of myths, lots of myths and lots of misunderstandings. But my tradition teaches that the soul in you and you and you and the Muslim brother and sister over there and the Syrian refugee over here, that we're all but Selim Elohim created in God's image. Although our sages in Jewish tradition talk about the body and the soul separately, the body and the soul are inextricably tied together. In the mind of the rabbinic sages, sin is not the product, product of an unruly body asserting itself over a pure soul. On the contrary, body and soul are seen in partnership with equal responsibilities for actions in this life and the next. The concept is illustrated in the following Talmud antidote from Sanhedrin. Emperor Antonius tried to convince Rabbi Jehuda Hanasi that the body and soul can excuse themselves from sin by claiming that the transgression is the fault of the other, since without its counterpart, the body, it is lifeless. Rabbi Yehuda counters with a parable. Two guards, one blind and one lame, are in a garden. Together they're able to steal some fruit from a high tree. When caught, each claims that he's obviously unable to commit the crime due to his disability. I, I can't see. I, I can't walk. How could I possibly reach the fruit? In the end, the orchard owner places the lame man on the back of the blind man, and they're judged as one. And similarly, God judges the action of the body and soul in partnership after returning the soul to the body each and every night. You see, we have a concept called tikkun hanefesh, repair of the soul. It speaks to the eternal nature of the soul. In Jewish mystical tradition, the soul which resides in the highest of heavens with the God who gave it can be reincarnated and must travel from the heavenly realm through the seven heavens earthward, through the Garden of Eden, to the earthly realm to be reborn. But like many other esoteric traditions, the soul must learn from each lifetime, perfecting and healing the soul of its traumas and its sins. You may have heard also the phrase tikkun olam, the healing and repair of the world. This is how we Jews talk about bringing our values, our ethics into the world through justice, equality, equity, by healing the world of its ills, by marching for justice, by helping the homeless, by working to end poverty, by engaging in civic betterment, we help repair the fabric of the universe. These ideas of healing and repair come from the same concept that they're at the moment of creation that was the Big Bang, or in Jewish parlance, the big breaking apart, that the first light of creation shattered seven sacred and holy vessels. And that vessels were supposed to contain that divine holy light that ended up in our souls because the sparks of that moment flew down to earth to reside in each of us. And you see those shattered vessel pieces, those shards, they too fell through the seven heavens to the earth. And human beings, well, we're charged with going around and collecting all those broken shards to try and put those sacred vessels together. You see, that is the tikkun, the repair, the repair of the vessels of creation, of the moment of creation. And when we connect soul to soul, we're bringing together that divine light, that initial light from that moment of breaking apart that we call that Big Bang, that moment of singularity. 
And our tradition believes that we're always moving back towards that, or forward towards that, since time is kind of relative, so Einstein taught us. And so that moment of coming together is what we're trying to do here. Your being here at Kola Me, our communities learning to work together, we're being, creating a tikkun, a healing. A healing in the world and a healing in our souls as we get to know one another. That's why the world today is not okay. That's why, and I'm going to go out on a limb here because I feel comfortable, so y'all can come and attack me afterwards. Politics matters. It can't be separate from what we do here, what we think here, what we pray here to make the world a better place because it's through policy, the way policy gets enacted, that affects each and every human being. Now, we can decide, oh, how many dollars we want to spend on this and how many dollars we want to spend on that. But a person of faith, a person of soul connection, a person that understands that the homeless person that's out there is just as treasured a soul in God's eyes as we are who drive our fancy cars and go out and spend hundreds of dollars on dinners at the newest restaurant, that matters in the voting booth. And that, my friend, has been what the kind of work I have done to take these deeply spiritual values of my tradition, to actualize them through how we treat one another, how we march in the streets, how we work for that, get those homeless folks in our city. The capital of homelessness in America is here in Los Angeles. And if we are not doing something together to address that, shame on us. We are bringing sin to our souls. Not their souls, not the homeless folks on the streets. We aren't doing right by them. That's how we bring divine sparks of fire together a tikkun of the nefesh, of the soul, and a tikkun of the world, tikkun olam. Now, these were radical ideas by my mystics of my tradition, but this idea of the eternal soul's healing is reemerging. It is the call of our time, the repair of the physical realm, the world and the heavenly realm, are calling out to us with greater urgency than ever before. Soul to soul connections, that, that's what's important. When we get in deep with each other, honest, unvarnished, open, vulnerable, learning to trust, because so many of us have had trust broken in our lives. So to that queen of soul, Aretha Franklin, Aretha, your music reminded us of our humanity through your humanity. Aretha Franklin's body may have worn out from its fight with cancer, but I am sure that her soul lives on as her many gifts of music will live on, hopefully animating us, calling us, for a blessing, teaching us, and that each time you hear her sing R-E-S-P-E-C-T, think of the dignity of her life, of her music, and the dignity of each and every human soul. That, my friends, would be amazing, and that is a gift of grace, so may it be God's will.